I made a new friend today, a listener of this podcast, a postdoctoral neuroscientist named Kartik got in touch sometime last week and we arranged a phone call to discuss the problem of consciousness. Over the course of about an hour and a half this afternoon we covered a range of topics. Most invigorating was a hypothesis we seem to have independently come to about the role of temporal geometry in the form of conscious contents. I think Kartik and I will have a lot more great conversations. I'm reminded by this of how isolated my work has been over these months since I began writing and recording the podcast. The potential exists to undertake this pursuit with a much higher degree of vigor and productivity by sharing the project with others. And that is really what I want to do. Science is a collaborative project and one gets tired of hearing oneself think. Sharing ideas through open-ended conversation with intelligent, creative people seems to me to be the most exciting way to pursue difficult problems. Thanks for the excellent discussion, Kartik. I am a conscious being. It is like something to be me. If you are willing to trust me on that, I'll afford you the same courtesy. As I have said before on this podcast, I am not a human animal. I am the mind of a human animal. The mystery that I am on a mission to understand is no less than what I am, what you are, and what the hell we are doing here. In the previous episode, I discussed the fact that there are specialized local modules in the cerebral cortex. Some of these modules are lateralized to a single hemisphere, a fact we know from studies of split brain patients. The focus of today's episode is the division of consciousness that apparently occurs in the case of split brains. Of course, consciousness itself cannot really be divided. Rather, loss of communication between the hemispheres by means of severing the corpus callosum appears to render each hemisphere its own independent mind. Those neural activities which occur in the right hemisphere are unknown to those of the left hemisphere and vice versa. Accordingly, the conscious contents which arise from those lateralized activities are only realized in the mind emergent from that side of the brain. The corpus callosum is a massive bridge-like structure composed of a huge number of axons that cross from one cortical hemisphere to the other. A much smaller bridge is called the anterior commissure. Both of these fiber bundles are severed in a complete split-brain procedure. This is a very rare procedure that has been used to control intractable epilepsy by preventing the spread of neural activity from one hemisphere to the other. It has reportedly been effective in many patients for preventing generalized convulsive seizures. As you might know, the brain is organized such that the left cortical hemisphere receives sensory inputs from the right side of the body and vice versa. Likewise, outputs from the motor cortex control voluntary movements on the opposite side of the body. This occurs because the axons that project into the central nervous system cross over to the other side prior to reaching the thalamus and cerebral cortex. Efferent axons going out of the motor cortex also cross over to the other side on their way to the muscles which they innervate. The case with vision is a little different. You might expect that the left eye projects to the right visual cortex and the left eye projects to the right hemisphere. In fact, axons from each retina project to both hemispheres, but this occurs in an orderly fashion by means of certain populations of axons crossing over at the optic chiasm while others do not. This results in all of the axons corresponding to the right visual field projecting to the left hemisphere, while all of the axons corresponding to the left visual field project to the right hemisphere. The visual field to the left of center of both eyes arrives in the right visual cortex, and the visual field to the right of center of both eyes arrives in the left visual cortex. Roger Sperry was a major pioneer in split brain research. He was awarded the Nobel Prize in 1981 for a body of split brain work beginning in animals including rodents, monkeys, and great apes that effectively showed the possession of two separate minds by these animals. In human split brain patients, the original report suggested that there were no overt functional deficits. That is, until Michael Gazaniga and the neurosurgeon Joseph Bogan 
did a closer investigation of a patient identified as W.J., who had a complete split brain procedure to control the grand mal seizures that he had suffered for 15 years since a war injury that he sustained in 1944. What they found was published with Roger Sperry in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in 1962. In his book, Tales from Both Sides of the Brain, Michael Gazzaniga describes a number of interesting experimental discoveries over the years of his career, often working with the patient W.J. In this episode, I will share some of those findings with you. First, the initial study in W.J. that was published in 1962. The patient was directed to fixate his eyes on a dot in the middle of a screen. Then, the researchers would flash a picture of a simple shape either to the right or to the left of that dot. When it was flashed to the right visual field, which is to the left cortical hemisphere, W.J. told them that he saw the shape. But when it, when it was flashed to the left visual field, which is to the right cortical hemisphere, W.J. reported that he did not see anything. After that, the researchers asked W.J. to fixate on the dot and simply point to anything he saw. Gazzaniga writes, quote, A circle is flashed to the right of fixation, allowing his left brain to see it. His right hand rises from the table and points to where the circle has been on the screen. We do this for a number of trials where the flash circle appears on one side of the screen or the other. It doesn't matter. When the circle is to the right of fixation, the right hand controlled by the left hemisphere points to it. When the circle is to the left of fixation, it is the left hand controlled by the right hemisphere that points to it. One hand or the other will point to the correct place on the screen. That means that each hemisphere does see a circle when it is in the opposite visual field, and each, separate from the other, could guide the arm or hand it controlled to make a response. Only the left hemisphere, however, can talk about it." Unquote. Christoph Koch discusses the differences between the apparent functions of the left hemisphere and those of the right in his book The Quest for Consciousness. He notes that these lateral specializations have been shown in both split-brain patients and in normal patients treated with the barbiturate drug sodium amytal injected into either the right or left carotid artery. In the latter case, the targeted hemisphere is suppressed for a few minutes, allowing behavioral tests to be done with just the untreated cerebral hemisphere. Koch writes, quote, The single most dramatic finding from these investigations is the ability to speak, and to a lesser extent to comprehend language, is limited to one, the dominant hemisphere. In more than 9 out of 10 patients, it is the left cortical hemisphere that speaks, communicates through writing, and deals with other aspects of language with ease. The right cortical hemisphere has only limited language comprehension and can't talk, although it can sing. When a split-brain patient talks, it is his or her dominant hemisphere that is in control. The non-dominant hemisphere is mute. It can still signal, however, by nodding the head or making meaningful signs with the fingers of the opposite hand." Unquote. There is evidence that the right hemisphere is better at spatial cognition, visual attention, visual perception, and imagery. In his book, Gazzaniga relays a number of interesting experiments that were done with patient W.J. and others, including patient J.W. Yes, I got W.J. and J.W. mixed up when reading the book. One example has to do with the capacity to do two things at once, one directed by his left hemisphere and the other directed by his right. The experiment was designed and carried out by a graduate student, Jim Eliason. The result was apparently so spectacular that he was on a PBS special hosted by Alan Alda. Gazzaniga writes, quote, Imagine yourself armed with a pad of paper and a pencil in each hand, sitting looking at a dot right smack in the middle of a TV screen. Simple visual geometric shapes will be flashed, and all you have to do is draw them simultaneously. Easy, right? It is easy only if both the pictures flashed are the same thing. So if two circles are flashed, no problem. If a circle and a square are flashed, however, it's a big problem for you and me and Alan Alda. We start, then stop, then draw something out of whack. None of it is done simultaneously. Instead, each hand works in an alternative style. In short, with this little task, the human and his great big brain seem totally flummoxed. Now JW is asked to do the same thing. The two circles, no problem. The square in the circle, again, no problem, and done instantly. It was as if two people were present, one guiding each hand with absolutely no interference from the other." Unquote. This result accords well with observations in some split-brain patients of the two hands signing different responses to the same question from a researcher. For example, Koch relays a story from a videotaped interview wherein the patient is asked how many seizures she has recently experienced. She signals three fingers with her right hand, at which point her left hand 
reaches over and forces the fingers of her right hand to go down. She apparently paused after going through this little battle, ultimately signaling three fingers with her right hand and one with her left. Stories like this one demonstrate the astounding fact that the two split hemispheres really have two separate minds that can be queried by investigators. Another experiment that Gazaniga relays in Tales from Both Sides of the Brain was accomplished by Steve Luck, who applied a common test from the attention field. The subject is shown an array of blue and red squares and asked to locate a target. When more and more distracting squares are added to the display, Gazaniga writes, quote, When neurologically intact subjects do this task, an interesting and consistent behavior occurs. As more distractors are added, it takes longer to find the target. In fact, our response time goes up in a reliable way. Every time two more distractor squares are added to the distractor array, it takes another 70 milliseconds to respond. The distractors slow down our search to find the one target. This happens like clockwork. It also doesn't matter where in the left or right visual fields the added distractors appear. Split brain patients respond in a dramatically different manner. When the extra distractors are added to a single visual field, the patients, not surprisingly, take longer to find the target, like everyone else. However, when that same number of added distractors is spread out, such that each field gets half of them, the overall reaction time is much faster when compared to everyone else. In other words, each disconnected hemisphere seems to have its own attentional scanning machinery, and each can go to work simultaneously and independently of the other half-brain. Luck did these studies on JW and also on the Caltech patient LB." Unquote. There are certain kinds of stimuli that when presented to one hemisphere have an impact on the other. These are of an emotional kind, and the reason for this is because emotions are driven by subcortical structures which are not split. The outcome is that the emotion occurs in the contralateral brain, but that hemisphere has no access to where the emotion is coming from. One example of this was an experiment in which Michael Gazaniga flashed a picture of a naked woman to the right hemisphere. The split brain subject grins and begins to laugh. Gazaniga asks her why she was laughing, and she said, I don't know. That is a funny machine you have there. Her left hemisphere, which was doing the talking, was having a feeling but couldn't know what had brought it on. The thing that strikes me as most compelling and mysterious about split brain research is not the differences between them and the rest of us, but rather the degree to which they are the same as we are. In particular, since patients speak exclusively from their left hemisphere, a conversation between the patient and another person is a conversation with the mind of his left hemisphere. From a naive perspective, I would expect patients like WJ to report that he can no longer feel the left side of his body, that he has a blind spot in his left visual field. It seems exceedingly weird that this is not the case. The half mind doesn't seem to feel like half a mind, like it has lost anything. This must be telling us something important about the conscious mind. I have told you before that the cerebral cortex is organized into hierarchies and Top topographical maps. Could it be that since WJ's left hemisphere does not have the maps that represent the left side of his body, the left visual field, and so on, that it has no means to evaluate what is missing? The mind that now occurs in the left thalamic cortex has no way of knowing about networks that used to be connected to it. But what about memory? Doesn't WJ's left hemisphere remember the conscious content that used to emerge from those now disconnected networks? Perhaps not. Memory is stored widely in the cortex. I propose that recall invo involves re-engagement of those very networks to reproduce in the mind a trace of their activities during the original episode being recalled. Episodic memories that involve networks situated in both hemispheres, as they usually do, will be encoded within all of the relevant networks. So if you ask WJ about the events leading up to his surgery, he can tell you with accuracy. Presumably, if you ask him a simple question about those events, he could signal with his left hand an accurate answer to the question. Those episodic memories involve a large quantity of networks on both sides of the brain. After all, both hemispheres saw what was going on in their visual systems and heard what was said and so on. Even now, with the hemispheres isolated, common daily experiences are separately encoded in memory by each side. This would cause the hemispheres to largely agree about what is happening and what has happened in the past. Integrated information theory allows for the possibility of separate islands of consciousness occurring in a common brain. This situation was described in a paper by Oizumi et al. in 2014, which proposed that the substrate of consciousness could condense into major and minor complexes. 
My criticism of this idea is that I don't see how the substrate of consciousness could be one system now and another later without producing two distinct conscious minds, one having no knowledge or access to the contents of the other. The conscious mind that I am trying to explain is a single, unified composition, but split-brain research does present a challenge. According to my framework, the TICL, the contents of consciousness are unified in a single mind by means of integration into a single massive system. Subsystems within it are detectable and meaningful from the point of view of the system. If the brain is split down the middle, such that two thalamocortical systems result, each will have its own conscious mind composed of its own contents. Those contents will be meaningful to that lateralized system in which their subsystems occur. Something feeling different from before, the sense that something is missing, does not occur because there is no subsystem producing that feeling. No subsystem to produce that feeling means that nothing is amiss from each point of view. It may have occurred to you to wonder what would happen to the continuity of your being if you were subjected to a split brain operation. Would you continue being as the left hemisphere alone? The right hemisphere? If there are two minds, which one would be you? Maybe neither one. But that is nothing new. The same thing could be wondered of your brain, your brain's mind yesterday and the one you are identified with today. Perhaps it really is an error to think that we have ever existed before this moment or that we will ever exist again.